Mongolia is one of the enigmas in the world today. Remote and relatively inaccessible, it's a country which few people from the West have ever visited. For many years, this land, with its tales of horse-riding nomads and caravans of camels, had fascinated me. However, our initial approaches to make a film there met with little success, and the idea only became reality when Professor Owen Lattimore, the Central Asian explorer and Western expert on Mongolia, agreed to help us. His attachment and commitment to this part of the world spans over half a century. As our advisor, he helped us negotiate an agreement with the Mongolians. This agreement made it clear that whilst we could use our own cameraman and sound recordist, we would always be accompanied by an interpreter and a television organiser who would supervise both the subject matter and the shots we took. Since we were the first Western television team to be allowed to make a film in Mongolia, the Mongolians were anxious that we should present the best possible image of their country. The films are the result of two journeys we made with Professor Latimore, the first in the summer of 1974 and the second in the following winter. The Mongolian People's Republic is the size of all Western Europe and has a population of a little less than one and a half million. And I remember one day uh, seeing a caravan of camels loaded with wool being led into the, uh, uh, the station yards uh, at railhead and the camels kneeling, grunting as they kneeled beside the railway cars and the loads being taken directly off the camels uh, into the railway wagons. And it struck me dramatically that here was the age of Marco Polo meeting the age of modern steam and industry. Uh, and I thought that uh, right then uh, that I would abandon my job and go uh, traveling into that distant background uh, to find out what it was all about. And I've been doing a good deal of that ever since.
Mongolia stands near the center of the great zone of migration between the Hungarian plains and the plains of Manchuria and North China. Through it passed also trade routes from India, Tibet, Persia, uh, and uh, the Siberian wilderness, uh, rich in valuable furs. And it was also a part of the great area in which the, the way of living of the horse-riding nomads developed. The great legend in which there is a lot of historical truth that the nomadic way of life uh, provided for the emergence of horse riding warriors was not peculiar to the Mongols and it wasn't invented by Chinggis Khan. The same thing existed in the entire nomadic band from Hungary to Manchuria. In warfare, Chinggis Khan developed the advantages of Mongolian horse riding mobility. The mobility of animal property of all kinds was important because uh, the Mongols had uh, an army which could be followed by flocks and herds and families, including the women. <laughs> But it is a great mistake to think of the Mongols as primarily a warrior nation. They preferred to live in peace. Uh, there is a, a celebrated uh, birch bark manuscript that was recovered uh, in Russia, in the area invaded by the Mongols, uh, which was written by uh, a Mongol warrior lad 
uh, Far From Home, uh, and the uh, song is in alternate stanzas, one to be sung by the son and the other by his mother, the son lamenting uh, his separation from his homeland and the mother lamenting that she may never see her son again. Now this uh, gives you a sort of human insight into the fact uh, that uh, the conquests of Chinggis Khan, which involved so much suffering for other people, also inflicted suffering on the Mongols themselves. We then come to a long period uh, in which the Mongol empires broke up, uh, the power of Mongolia as a state declined, but as sometimes happened, while the state grew weaker, the ruling classes within the state grew stronger, and hence we have a long period of very, well, you can only call it vicious uh, oppression of the people by their own nobility, uh, and aristocracy, their feudal nobility. I was not there at the time, but I was traveling soon after that in regions which had not yet been reached by the revolution. So I can say that though I never saw the revolution itself, I have seen its consequences for nearly 50 years. You might think seeing people riding horses, milking camels, cows, ewes, goats, that this is an old nation only at the beginning of transformation. On the contrary, the people who are doing these things are also literate people who run their own collectives, which are called Nigdal. This Nigdal, Freedom Nigdal, supports 3,000 people and 80,000 head of livestock. <laughs>
Hadi bakalım. Hadi bakalım. Doktor açık gitti. 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 From the time they are eight, all the children of the collective go to the Nigdil school. Those whose camps are too far away board at school during the term. Can you hear that? 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 So let me keep on saying you here now. Yamal Meritil Sotlana. Baxi. Baxi. Baxi.
In this Nigdo, as everywhere else in Mongolia, the transition from the old method of pasturing animals under the authoritarian control of nobles and clergy was a transition that paid a human cost. People knew that they wanted to get rid of the old before they were quite sure about the methods of the new. And like every country that has gone through the process of collectivization, there was an early period in which the enthusiasts went too far. And this uh, resulted not only in losses, uh, but in some areas of Mongolia in actual uprisings, which were exploited by those members of the old society who wanted the new society not to succeed. They got over this period of excess uh, in a famous new policy of the early 1930s, which was called the New Turn. And uh, they restrained uh, the extremists who were going too fast and went over to a system of persuasion and education. I know myself families which, in this second period of transition, uh, held out from the collectives, but they weren't forced in. They were allowed to continue. And the real turning point was when such families found that the people in the collectives were doing better than the people who were hanging on to their private herds. This camp is part of a brigade, and a brigade is an autonomous operating unit of a collective. Uh, you can have a sheep herding brigade, a camel herding brigade, an irrigation brigade. But while it is autonomous in operating its own business, uh, it is also a unit of the nigdal or collective, uh, and therefore its work and its interests have to be coordinated by the central committee of the nigdal. Ta 
за ийм хүн шинжилт дээр отор нүүдлээ бол кия гэж ингэж удаа төлөвлөж байгаа. Ийм хүн чинь бас ингэж удаа гарахад илтгэж байх, харч байх, ийм асуул хэрэгтэй зүзэж байна. Тэ зэрэглэлдээ сүм энэ утгаар отор дж болох уу? Бол нь зүзэж байгаа гэдэг. Every member of the Nigdo draws pay according to an elaborate work points system. But he also gets a bonus for exceeding the normal production rate. I think a point about collective ownership in the Nigdos that needs to be made clear is that private ownership also continues. A man, or rather a family, can own horses, cows, other livestock. But why have private ownership at all? Because, for one thing, the people in the collectives are extremely prosperous. What they draw from the collectives is pay uh, and their yearly share of the production, which gives them a good deal of purchasing power. The Nigdal Center is a group of administrative buildings surrounded by a village of tents. The people uh, ride in here to buy what they need, and of course, not only do individuals come in for personal business, but the representatives of brigades and other units ride in here to consult with the central authorities about this and that. There is a school here, a hospital. The party has its own uh, buildings and center. So does the youth league. Then there is the uh, Nigdal shop. Uh, there is also, interestingly enough, a small distillery uh, which produces liqueurs flavored with uh, Gobi Desert uh, berries and fruits of various kinds. the salt lake close to the Nigdal center is frozen over for several months. are at their prime after the good autumn grazing. And this is also the breeding season in which the bull camels are in rut. They then froth at the mouth, and it is astonishing to see the way the foam freezes around their muzzles. <laughs> Oh, 
The committee which is meeting here consists of the chairman, uh, two deputy chairmen, the uh, chief of the cadre, the head of the youth league, the head of the veterinary service in the Nigdal, the head engineer, and the chief of the women's league, and the head accountant. In some ways, the accountant is one of the most interesting figures of all. When you have a revolution that is trying to take people from the Middle Ages into the 20th century, the sudden introduction of things like double entry bookkeeping uh, is uh, just about as revolutionary as you can get. In the old days, practically everything they produced uh, was taken away from them, uh, either by the nobility uh, or by the clergy. Uh, today, everything they produce uh, goes into the common fund of the collective, and from it they draw uh, wages as they go along, and also a share of profits uh, at the end. Uh, so that uh, the great change between the new Mongolia and the old Mongolia is that in the old Mongolia there was great wealth among a few people, contrasted with utter poverty among the majority of the people, uh, whereas today I should say that the standard of living 
uh, here is higher than anywhere else in Asia that I have seen. From Freedom Nigdo, it is about 80 miles to Altai, the capital of the province. The outside temperature is minus 40 degrees. The buildings are heated by underground flues running from a central heating station. Young people uh, are urged to realize that the old skills still have value and that the older men who know these skills uh, should be respected, that the young should learn from the old.
Mongolia has a long, long history and a marvelously rich history. There is a chapter of it here. This is a burial ground of the early Metal Age. And these graves here are important not only to the history of Mongolia, but to the history of that vast belt of country where Europe and Asia melt into each other, Eurasia. Graves of this type spread from the eastern part of Mongolia all the way through to um, the Black Sea, the Danube, Hungary. The people of these mountains were at the same time shepherds, also cultivators, and workers of metal. The fact that they were cultivators is indicated partly by the way the uh, graveyards are distributed, because there was quite a primitive science also in the selection of sites. Uh, it was carefully regulated according to where the sun rose, where the southern exposure was uh, for greatest warmth in winter, and where water was for uh, irrigation. This technique of irrigation uh, is not something new. This is very, very ancient. It has centuries of history behind it. All for many, many centuries here in Western Mongolia, in little spots where there are where, where there are natural oases, all through the centuries, people have done a bit of cultivation. This type of channel digging, this kind of uh, blocking the channels with a clod of earth, has been known for many centuries. In fact, probably since toward the end of the Stone Age, there has been cultivation in little natural patches uh, of water in the Gobi, water seeping out through the scree at the base of the mountains. And uh, at various times in Mongol history, uh, when there has been a settled government over a, r a relatively large area, we know even from the written sources that time and again agriculture and fruit growing and so on have been developed. Then in periods of warfare, they die down, but they never quite die out. we're seeing now really is uh, a larger scale application under the conditions of a socialist government capable of organizing and coordinating the whole country and capable of long-range planning uh, a revival of these very ancient techniques in a modern form.
the maker and leader of the Mongolian Revolution, is honored in Ulaanbaatar on the 50th anniversary of the proclamation of the Republic. Thank <laughs> you. 